Praise the Lord. Let's all stand.
stop the light from shining through We do Do you wish that you could see it all me? We do Is all creation It is It's the glory of the Lord To be the light within our midst It is Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is Is anyone worthy is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? singing on a And as Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those he loves, he does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone Lord, thank you, Gary. Awesome song. He is worthy. And uh, we'll touch on this a little, we'll be touching on this later in the message, but he is worthy, and because of his worthiness, we also can be found worthy. But it's all dependent on his worthiness. So we'll be in 1 John chapter number 4. We're going to finish 1 John chapter number 4, Lord willing, this morning. That is my plan, 
That's one of the most difficult things as we go through the book of 1 John, for me, has been where to start and where to stop. Because like we've talked about so much with the book of 1 John and with the writer of the, of the book, John, um, the Apostle John, every conversation, every topic, it just keeps coming around, right? He, he, he has a topic of a conversation talking about love and light and then he kind of transitions into uh, false teaching, and then he comes back to love, and, and then he stays on love, and then he stays on love some more. So today's message is actually going to be a continuation of that love message. Um, and, and obviously, John was making uh, these people, the, the churches, the various house churches, and the people, the Christians there uh, in and around Ephesus at the time that he was writing specifically to, uh, that they needed a lesson on love, uh, on true love, on Christ's love, on that agape love, that love that we've talked about so many times over the last few months, uh, that kind of love that we talked about that shows up with work boots on, you know, that's willing to get dirty, that's willing to do the things uh, that um, the people around us need, not an emotional, oh, I love that, but a, let's get to work, I love that. Right? Let, let's show up. Let's do the things that are difficult. Let's build into people's lives, even if they can't help me in any way. Especially if they can't help me in any way. Not just the people I love, either. The people that maybe I don't like a whole lot. I have to love them, right? Because John keeps telling us, keeps saying, Jesus loved you, so you have to love them. But even those people that we don't necessarily always get along with, we still have to love them. And John is continuing in that, in that vein uh, this morning. Remember last week we talked about uh, love and how that love was manifested. And, and how that, you know, we kind of got in towards the end of the message a little bit about how that um, we are to be the conduit of God's love. Right? And, and I dramatically went over and turned the lights off and said, you know, how, how that if the love of God is not flowing through us, what does our church look like? It just looks like darkness, right? The, the world, the, the people around us, the, you know, the, the, if we're not showing love, that's how Jesus says we will be known as his people. That's how we will be known, is by the love that we have one for another. And how that Jesus, because Jesus died on the cross, because Jesus is the propitiation, I'm going to say that word as much as I can, I love it, uh, that which covers, that which satisfies the need for um, the punishment that we have on our lives because of the sin that we create. Because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection on the cross, because of Jesus' blood, that covers our sin. And because of that, because Jesus so loved us, so ought we. Not a, not a question, not a, not a, well, we maybe ought to. We, we should ought to. We ought to. This is something that we are commanded to do. Because Jesus loved us like this, we are to love those around us in like manner. So this week, like I said, we're going to continue on the topic of love. And we'll read verses 13 uh, through 21 in 1 John chapter number 4. Hereby know we that... Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God, whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God, love his brother also. Let's go ahead and uh, open with a, a word of prayer here. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this time that we can come together in your house. 
uh, that we could come together as a church body and we could worship you in spirit and truth and we can rightly divide your word and we can see the things that you have laid on the writers through the years and that you have uh, provided a way that, that your word has been preserved for thousands of years so that we can have it today in, in the same perfection that, that you had it written in, Lord, and that uh, from that, we can learn so much about ourselves, and, and more importantly, we can learn about you and how that we can have a relationship with you and how that you provided for that relationship. I just pray that everyone here today would, would hear the words that you would have, that, that your spirit would penetrate the hearts of, the, of everyone this morning that hears this, that are in this building today and that are watching online and that may watch online in the future. Just pray that your word would not come back void, as you promise it won't, Lord. Just pray that we would uh, be affected, that we would be motivated to, to have that sacrificial love that you showed for us. Just pray that you would be with us as, as we do have a heavy heart for the Snell family as well, Lord, that, um, that we would continue to lift them up and that we would uh, continue to honor them. Uh, we love you, we thank you, and we ask all these things in your name. Amen. All right, well, John is back at it, like I said, and, and actually, I'm going to go ahead, and I'm going to read verses 11 and 12. They're, I don't have slides for those, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and read 11 and 12 with me. If not, just listen. I promise I'll read it pretty right, <laughs> as bright as I can, you know, I don't mess up. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, in us and his love is perfected in us. So John covers there in verse 12 that love is an evidence of God dwelling in us. And that as a result of God dwelling in us, that our love for one another can be perfected, right? So the way that the Bible speaks of perfected is a little different is how we view the word perfect and that sinless. It's not really saying that. It's saying matured, right? Brought to totality, um, that, that it's, it's your, our love can be can reach a level of maturity through Christ that couldn't otherwise be realized if we didn't have Christ. And we see that in the world today, right? We see people that you know use love in a lot of different ways. And our society would have us to believe that love is acceptance. That love equals accepting whatever and anything that is that's going on in this world. That that. If you truly love someone, you'll let them do whatever they want. No matter, but that's not that's not true love. And any parent in here would know that to be true. Your four-year-old would probably love to stick a knife in the light socket. And if you, the world hasn't gone this far yet, but they're not far away from it. Well, if you love him, just let him do it. I'm sure it'll be all right. It, teach him what love. It's not love, right? Love is stay away from the light socket with the fork or a knife or saw, anything metal. So the world, in many senses, has that warped sense of love. And John, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wants to clear that up for us and what love truly is. And, and, and so we can reach that maturity level of understanding of love through understanding the love of Christ. And then in, in verse 13, he says that another way that we can know that we're dwelling in him is that the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit. Now, certainly um, when we accept Christ as our Savior, we have that indwelling of the Holy Spirit, right? Um, that is when the Holy Spirit comes to reside in us. We are the, the Lord's temple in that situation. And that we have the Holy Spirit. But not only do we have the Holy Spirit, but notice it says that we have of His Spirit. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So not only do we have His Holy Spirit living inside of us, but we will be a new creature. We have of His Spirit. We become in His likeness. And that's a... Um, ongoing process of sanctification that we're going to have for the rest of our life from the moment that we've accepted Christ into our heart up until uh, we die or the Lord returns, right? That is a process that, that will never fully come to, you know, until we're, until we're perfect, until we're with Christ. Um, so 
but that is we become that new creature. Old things are passed away. We look different to the world, to those around us. We, we do things different. We act differently. The Holy Spirit makes us new. We've talked about uh, Moses on the Mount of Sinai several times. Let's flip over to Exodus 34, 29. Um, Brother Sam Varghese, I don't even remember how long ago it was at this point, preached a message that I haven't been able to get rid of. Um, it's just something that totally goes through my mind all the time. And, and he contrasted this verse compared to Samson. And in this verse, we'll see that due to Moses' interaction with God, he wist not. And Samson, later on, because of his lack of interaction with God, he wist not that the Holy Spirit had left him. He didn't realize that because of his continued um, actions, the way that he continued, continually you know, fought against God and didn't do what God would have for him to do, he didn't realize that he had lost the power of the Holy Spirit. But here in Exodus 20, 34, 29, we're going to see Moses, and it says, And it came to pass, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from that mount, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked to them. He had no idea that his face looked like the sun. He wist not. That's also one of those fun things that I like to say. Because we don't say it normally, right? It doesn't seem like our normal vernacular. But he wist not that his face shone. He had no clue. But it did. And it did because he had just spent time with the Lord. Constantly. Over a period of a long period of time. He sought the Lord's face. He, he communed with God. He dwelled in God. He abided in God. And when he came down, everyone saw this guy that just looked different. His face was bright. This is weird stuff. He had a clue. And that's how we should be to the world. We might not even realize it. We might not, we, we wish not. But we should appear different to those around us because we're abiding in God and God in us. We have the Holy Spirit abiding in us, right? Living in us. But how much of us are we allowing the Holy Spirit to control? Right? We can have the Holy Spirit in us and not shine. We know people like that. I won't ask you to name names. It's probably not helpful. But we also know people that have that shine, and you just know there's something about them that's different. I was talking to Mr. Johnson this week about a potential teacher that we're, that we're trying to, um, that we're going to be interviewing this week. And, and I said, you know, I said he, he's just, he's different. He, you, you can tell that this relationship with Jesus is a real thing to him. We, you know, we, we say it all the time, right? I'll pray for you. Then we go on about our life, right? We know lots of people that will pray for us. But he's the kind of guy that says, I'll pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray. Right there. It's weird. Have you ever been in a public situation like that? Where someone says, I'll pray for you, and then they just start praying? It's, it's a little awkward sometimes. He was not. He didn't do that for me. He didn't do that as a show. He, it's just who he is. He truly has that attitude that the Bible talks about, about pray without ceasing. That he knows that he has that op open communication with the Lord. He knows that he can go boldly to the throne of grace. It's not just words. It's action. And that's how we can know. Yes, we have the Holy Spirit. If we've accepted Christ as our Savior, if we've asked Him to come into our heart, if we believe on Him, if we know that He died on the cross for our sins, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But how much of the, you does the Holy Spirit have? Do you walk around with nodding <laughs> that you're shining? Can the world see it? If somebody was describing you to somebody else, would they go, you know, he's weird, not in that way, in a good way. In the... In the, he exemplifies the love of Christ. 
he is a conduit of the love of God. He reflects the love of God. He's just different. She's just different. You can see that their relationship with the Lord is real because it is who they are. It's not what they do. It's not just words. It's deed as well. And that's who we are called to be. We can have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, but are we showing the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23. Very popular verse. You know, I also, it's one of those things that I hear people talk about the fruits of the Spirit. This is the fruit of the Spirit, right? Singular. So this all comes in one fruit, right? If you have one and in you're in your abiding in Christ and you're dwelling in Christ and you're living, not that you don't have mess ups, not that you don't do stupid things. We all know that that's true. And, and John throughout his passage and throughout his epistle and, and throughout the Bible, a lot of times when we're, when we're having these conversations, um, it's all or nothing. And, and he means an attitude of, right? This isn't one of those situations that, you know, if you, if you've, get mad at somebody or say something stupid, we all make mistakes. We, we still have that sinful nature, right? We can't get rid of that. We're not perfect. Um, it, it's, even though some people, you know, claim to be. We're not. Um, but this is an attitude of it, right? An attitude of love and a, a constant dwelling with the Holy Spirit. But Galatians 5.22 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is, number one, the thing that we can't stop talking about that we shouldn't stop talking about, that the Bible puts so much emphasis on that we need to continue to go over and over and over again is love. It's number one on the list. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. These are all the things... That when we're walking around today, down in the gym, with everyone that we know and love, and then when we go home, and then we go to work, these are the things that we should be whisk nodding in our lives, right? We shouldn't, we might not even realize it, but the people around us should see these things exemplified in our life. When we're dwelling in God, we are producing the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Verse 14, And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. John reminds the reader, this isn't just something that, you know, I dreamt one night. I lived with this guy. We have seen it, the other apostles and I. We saw this on a daily basis. And I'm telling you, I'm testifying this is first-hand knowledge that I have. Think of everything that John saw. Just the stuff that we know about. He also said, if I wrote about everything I saw, there wouldn't be enough script, there wouldn't be enough paper, right? I, my hand would fall off. There wouldn't be enough paper for me to record everything that I saw and heard. But think of the things that we know about. All the miracles that he saw. All the Pharisees that he saw get mad at Jesus. All of those things that John experienced, he said, I saw it. I lived it. I know without a shadow of a doubt that the Father sent Jesus so that he could be the Savior, not just of us, but the whole world. Everyone can do it. Everyone can be saved. You haven't done anything that could take you from the love of God. You have to be willing to accept him. You have to be willing to acknowledge him. To come to him. To believe on him. But it's open for anybody. John said, I saw it. Can you imagine? John saw Lazarus raised from the dead. Miracles are awesome. I can't imagine being around and seeing those exciting miracles. He saw Lazarus come back from the dead. And that was probably exciting. But you know what was more important than the miracles? was Jesus. Miracles are cool and all, but what happened to Lazarus a few years later? We don't know exactly when, but Lazarus died again, right? So the miracle, while it is exciting, Jesus is greater than the miracles that he performed. 
Because ultimately, his death, burial, and resurrection made that we are going to rise again. We we will live forever. We will have eternal communion with the Lord because of the work that he did on the cross. All we got to do is accept it. All we got to do is believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know sometimes that we suffer from low self-esteem, and I know sometimes we think we're not good enough, and I know we get down on ourselves, and, you know, things happen in our life, and, 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 you know, we, we fall short, right? And that happens. But that information that Jesus died on the cross for you, in that while you were a yet sinner, even before you acknowledged him, he died for you? That's all the worth we need, folks. That should be all the confidence that we need. That Jesus, that God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. I mean, there's nothing else that could happen that could give me more confidence than that. That, 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 That was what Jesus was willing to do for us. Whosoever, verse 15, shall confess that Jesus is the son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. John says that we need to be confessing Jesus to the world. Once again, uh, this is an ongoing attitude, right? This is, should be who we are, uh, that we are willing to confess the Lord to the world, telling others about him. We are to be reflecting the Lord and Savior. We need to be looking like he looks. People need to see the difference in us. And that is a, another example of whether or not We are dwelling in the Holy Spirit. We are abiding in the Holy Spirit. That was something else that I said about that guy. I said, you know, every conversation that I've ever had with him, somehow Jesus comes into the conversation. Right? When that's who we are, when we are abiding in the Lord, we're in relationship with the Lord, we're spending time in prayer, we're reading the Bible, he just comes up. It's just who we are. It's like a, you know, a parent talking about their brand new baby. Doesn't matter what the conversation starts with. Eventually it's coming back to that baby. Because that's what they do. That's their life. They're abiding in that baby, taking care of that baby, waking up in the middle of the night with that baby. That is their life at that point. And if we are abiding and dwelling in the Lord, it becomes who we are. We can't avoid the conversation. Every time we talk, we are some way confessing the Lord, how that he's provided for us. And as Christians, as good Baptists, we know all the right words, right? Um, we, we know the things to say, and, and it's got to be deeper than that. It's got to be more than just deep do, or words. It's got to be indeed. It's got to be an action. It's got to be real to us in order for it to truly reflect the Lord. Verse 16, and we have known and believed that believe the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Furthermore, when we're confessing Jesus, when we are truly dwelling in the gospel of Christ, when we are having these conversations, when we are abiding in him, we are confessing Jesus. We believe the love of God. Once again, it's more than just words. We actually believe it. Romans 1.16, a popular verse, an important verse to us to remember. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and to the Gentile. And also to the Greek. Sorry, not the Gentile, the Greek. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation. If we're confessing the Lord, we're not ashamed of that gospel. We want to talk to people about that gospel. It becomes a topic of our conversation. And not just to unsaved people, just not to just people that we know don't don't believe on the Lord. It's the power of Christ. If you aren't saved, It's it's the most important decision that you can make as a believer. But even if you are saved, the gospel of Christ is something that you should be talking about because it should be who you are. It should be part of your everyday. You're abiding in him. It flows out of you. It, it, It is 
is the reason that we exist. It is our purpose in life is to tell others about the gospel of Christ. It is the power. It empowers us. It empowers us to be unashamed. What does it mean to be unashamed? It means that you have no guilt. You don't go, eh, well, I hate to tell somebody that. You don't, that doesn't come into you. You have no guilt about sharing it. You have no self-consciousness about sharing it. You have no doubt about sharing it. It's part of who you are. You're unashamed. You have full confidence. And then verse 17, we'll go right into this. It says, herein our love is made perfect. Once again, whole, complete. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so we are in this world. John reiterates what we talked about last week. Might be an important point. John keeps bringing it up. It's talked about in the Bible a lot. Our love is perfected, matured, made complete. When we are confessing Jesus, when we are dwelling in him, we don't have any guilt, we don't have any self-consciousness, we don't have any doubt about it, and we become bold. We have boldness in the day of judgment. Kind of weird, right? Got to think about that one a little bit. Why do we have boldness on the day? Shouldn't judgment day be the day we're concerned about? Because we know who we are. <laughs> we know the things that we've done. We're all sinners. So why do we have boldness on the day of judgment? It goes on and tells us there at the end, because as he is... So are we in this world, as he is, as who is, as Jesus is. We don't have to fear punishment. Because there is no punishment. When God looks down at us, he doesn't see our sins. He doesn't see all the stuff that we think about when we close our eyes or when we settle down that we regret all the things that we think about that Satan might push into our mind that, that you know, that we, we might, you know, get reminders of when, when we're sitting there and, and you know, it, it, it's tough to be still, right? Because when you're still, whew, our brain messes with this. Everything that we've ever done, every decision that might not have been great, it all comes back. God doesn't see that when he looks at us. What does he see? He sees the blood of Jesus. He sees the fact that our sins have been propitiated. There's that word again. He doesn't see the bad stuff. He sees his son's blood has paid those penalties already. So as Jesus is perfect, holy, righteous, that's what God sees in us. When he looks down as Christians, if you've accepted him, that's what God sees. So we can have boldness on the day of judgment because we're not getting judged for our sin. That should be exciting, guys. That should be something that motivates us to be unashamed of the gospel of Christ. We don't have to fear punishment. We went there last week. What did Jesus say? It is finished. He died on the cross. It's done. We don't have to worry about it. We don't have to be afraid. We can have boldness on the day of judgment because what does verse 18 say? There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Where does fear come from? Not from God. Why do we experience fear? What is fear? Fear is a result of not knowing something, right? That's what we get afraid of. Now, this verse isn't talking about if a spider were to fall down from the ceiling and land on my Bible. And my, I was telling Becky and them we were, there were some ants back there. We had those, like, cicada killer hornets one year at our house. And those, those bad boys were, like, this big. I mean, they are scary. And God's not talking about that kind of fear, Right? He's talking about that kind of fear that we're talking about, living in a state of 
worry, living in a state of uneasiness, living in a state of uh, self-consciousness, living in a state of doubt, living in a state where, you know, I am, we all know people that are fearful, right? That don't want to get out of their shell, that don't want to talk to people, that don't want, and, and God says the love that I have shared, the love that John says, the, the love that God has proven for you by sending his son to die on the cross should motivate you to not be afraid. What are we afraid of? Why are we not motivated to share the love of Christ? Are we fear, fearful of rejection? Might be, but are they rejecting you? They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus. Are we afraid of success? I don't know, maybe. What does success bring? <laughs> New people? Change? It's a scary word, isn't it? We don't like change. <laughs> we like comfortable. We like knowing what to expect when we come to church. We like being able to be sitting in our pew and know that such and such is there, such and such is there, such and such is there. Oh, such and such isn't here. I wonder what's going on there. We like that comfort of knowing what's going on. So if we're successful in sharing the love of Christ, things might look different. Are we afraid of that? We shouldn't be, because this isn't ours. It's the Lord's. We're here to serve him. We're here to reflect his love. We can't be afraid of what the church building looks like. We can't be afraid of what happens when people come here, because they're going to look different. They're going to talk different. Things are going to change. But praise the Lord, that's what we should want as a church. We should want that here. We need to be, stop being okay with okay. We need to stop with the mediocrity and we need to push forward and share the love of Christ with those around us. Those that we are called to share the love of Christ with. This, is, this has been a tough one for me this week. And, and just studying and, you know, the Lord's been dealing with me a lot on this kind of stuff. I've been, I've been saved, I've been a Christian for a long time. I mean, I was like, I don't remember how old I was. I remember the occurrence sitting in my, you know, in my garage with my dad and coming home after a Wednesday night. I remember it was a Wednesday night because he worked nights, and so it was weird that he was at church on Wednesday night with us. And I remember accepting the Lord, and I think I was probably four or five. I've been saved a long time. I've been a Christian for a long time. I've attended this church my entire life. And I know I haven't done what I need to be doing. I, I know that I need to do better. And I think we all can say the same things. We know we need to be doing better. I don't know if you guys have noticed or not, but we're where we are, and we're doing okay. We need to stop being okay with okay. We need to push forward. We need to not be fearful. We all know what that looks like, right? Perfect love, casting out fear. I look around the room, I see some moms that if you want to see fear cast out, mess with their kids. <laughs> that perfect love is going to come shining through, probably all over you if you're not careful. How we should be with the Lord's message. We should be motivated. There's a lot of people out there that need the Lord. And we don't do what we need to be doing. Perfect love. We need to try it. Verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. Now, I was as I was studying, the one guy I read said that in the Greek... The word him, we love him because he first loved us. The word him isn't in there in the original Greek. I don't know. I'm not Greek. Never studied it. 
But I think the, the message stays the same either way, right? We love because he loved us. We love him because he loved us. The only true example of love that we have, perfect example of love that we have, is Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. All the other love that we experience in our life pales in comparison to that love. I'll go ahead and read 20 and 21, and we'll get it wrapped up here because it's about lunchtime. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Doesn't get any plainer than that. I don't think I need to expound on that one too much. How can you love your brother? Your, how could you love God who you haven't seen? Who, how can you say that you love God who you haven't seen? And see your brother in everything that they're going on in the craziness of this world and, and still hate them. You know, we, we, have that, we have a tendency to get stuck in our own mind and only think about the things that we're going through. They should, they should, they should. But then when we, someone says something about us, we go, oh, well, the reason I did that was because I was having a bad day. So we want the benefit of the doubt from those around us, but we don't, most of the time, we don't want to give the benefit of the doubt. Once again, we got to love our brother and sister. This isn't an option. But most times, the way we interact with people, the most times, the way we act, it's not reflecting the love of God. Gary, if you come, play a verse for us. Everybody stand, your head bowed, eyes closed. I don't know where you are today. I know some of us are struggling. Maybe you have never accepted the Lord as your Savior, and you know that that's something that you need to do. Find somebody and talk to them. I'll talk to you if you, if you need a conversation. If you just want to take care of it right there where you sit, do that. We can't wait, folks. We can't wait for the perfect thing to show up. We can't wait for the perfect... I mean, honestly, we can't wait for the next pastor to be, you know, brought in and voted on. It's not what we're called for. We're called to be about the Father's work right now. And that is to show love one for the other. The topic of love has been talked about and beat into our heads a lot here. It's important. It's where it all comes from. The love that Jesus showed for us needs to be reflected in our lives. We need to be that conduit of the love of God. Maybe you are saved, but you're living in fear. You don't radiate the love of God because you're afraid of rejection. You're afraid of success. You're afraid, who knows what you're afraid of. You're afraid of people thinking you're weird. You're, you know, like, I, I don't know. But that perfect love that Jesus had wasn't afraid dealt with unimaginable torment. Also that all of us could be saved. Even in the midst of our worst sins, Jesus still died for us because he cares for us so much. And we won't even show the love of Christ to people that we know, people that we love. Let alone people that we don't know and that we don't love and that it's awkward to talk to. The Lord prepares hearts for us. We need to be praying to, to, to give us people to talk to. Because the Lord might be working in someone else's life that we don't even know that he's working. And we might be afraid, but that conversation might go really well. But we have to be willing to step out and to have those conversations. What fear do you need to drive out of your life? Or maybe you just need to come forward and talk to the Lord. Maybe you need to just pray. Maybe you need to 
doesn't have to be any huge decision in order to come forward. It can just be a conversation. Take a minute and let the Lord work on your heart. Well, thank you. Appreciate your attention, and I hope that the Lord has uh, has dealt with you on some stuff as He has me. So head on down to the gym, have you some good food. We'll go ahead and uh, dismiss in prayer. Remember, there is no services tonight. Dear Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to uh, hear about your love, Lord, and to study your your word and to hear about the love that you had for us. I just pray that if there's any here that don't know you that they would not waste their time, that they would come to you and, and confess you, Lord, that they would believe on your name, that they would accept you into their heart, that they would live, start living a life for you, Lord. And just pray for those that are saved, that we would quit being okay with okay and start pushing forward for your cause, Lord. Just pray for this food that we're about to eat, that be nourishment and strength for our bodies, keep us safe and have a good time of fellowship with each other and with you, Lord. We love you and thank you. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. You are dismissed.